morning about um, power, having a, an, an attitude of praise in our hearts and the difference that makes. And um, today is a great example. You know, it's, it's pouring with rain and someone keeps saying it's cold. And um, I find it rather bracing myself. <laughs> but um, we know that if you go up in an aeroplane, the clouds are below you and the sun is shining. You know, and it's the same with God. You know, despite our circumstances, everything else, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? But, um, I just want to take you through a passage in the New Testament, in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 34, if you've got a Bible. We have spare Bibles around the place if anybody wants to read along. But, um, I'll read up to verse 34. And this is Paul and Silas establishing the, the churches in the, uh, in the known world. Now it happened as we went to as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying these men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And he came out that very <coughs> day, that very hour. <coughs> but when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates tore on the clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they'd laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakened from sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was going to kill himself. But Paul said in a loud voice, Don't you do yourself any harm, for we're all still here. Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, and your whole household. So then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and all were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now he who had brought them to his house, he set food before them, and they rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Paul and Silas, about the business of establishing the church of Jesus Christ through the nations, through the regions around the, the um, Mediterranean Sea there. And um, every time they're seen by this slave girl, she cries out, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim the way of salvation. That might seem harmless enough, she's, like she's just announcing them every time they go past. But um, it wasn't helpful to have that announcement made day after day, every time we went past. And apart from that, it was probably done in a very mocking way. Oh, these men. And, you know, you, you get the kind of thing. that they, 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 She was mocking. It was a mocking spirit. So um, finally, Paul... He could take no more. He's had enough of it. Because he knew what was behind it. He knew that it was this evil spirit at the heart of it. A demonic thing. And he'd had enough of it. And he spoke to the demon and commanded it out of her. A bit of a riot ensued. And Paul and Silas ended up in jail. Nothing new there, if you know anything about the life of Paul. I've never been in jail. However, I have visited several. And thankfully, they let me out every time. But, um, these days to be put in prison I guess is, is, means a bit of an inconvenience by not being free to come and go as you please uh, other than that there's food there's warmth uh, shelter, entertainment TV, snooker 
sports, opportunity to train for a new career, do a degree even, so are some of the benefits of being on the inside. So when Paul and Silas were jailed, basically for doing an exorcism and in the process making this slave girl of no value because she couldn't do the fortune telling anymore and make the money. They weren't just jailed. The word says that they were beaten with rods, big sticks. They were beaten. That's not just a slap on the wrist. It says also that many stripes were laid on them. That's first century capital punishment. They would have been left in a mess. They would have been sore, they would have been bleeding, they would have probably been in shock. And after the beating, then they were thrown into jail. As I said, no nice, warm, clean cell, no snooker tables, no TV, no PlayStation. Cold, damp, smelly, rat-infested, dark. And on top of this, they'd been put into the stocks so they couldn't move. No human rights bill to protect them. Now put yourself in their position. How would you feel? And this isn't one of them, you know, how bad they've had it and how good we have it today kind of sermons. It's not like that. But just imagine what it would have been like if, if you were in that position. And, you know, I reckon it would go something like this for most of us, if we're honest. You're in the stocks. You know, you're bolted down. You can't move. It's, uh, I can't believe they did that to us. Don't they realise who we are? As soon as we're out of here, I'm going to call my solicitor. They can't do that. I know my rights. That's what we'd be saying, wouldn't we? We'd be moaning about it. Goodness, don't they know who we are? They can't do that to us. We're Christians. We haven't done any wrong. We'd be justifying ourselves. We'd be moaning about it. We'd be complaining to anybody that would listen. And even, you know, after we'd got out some time later, we'd still be going around moaning to people about it. Say what, and, you know, it would get to the stage when people would see us coming and they'd cross over the street and sort of, because they don't want to hear about it anymore, they've had enough. Yeah? Then we'd be going on about how uncomfortable it was with our feet in these stocks. Can't they make these things a bit more comfortable? Can't they have a bit of padding around where your feet go through? They're a bit tight. It's a bit cold down here. You can imagine the, the complaints that we'd have. I wonder how long we would be in that position, in that place, before we started thinking about God. How long? <coughs> and you know, usually we explore every avenue. We go through everything and then, oh yeah, hang on a minute. God. Yeah, God. Maybe we start praying. Maybe we start rejoicing. Maybe we start praising him hard to do sometimes in these kind of circumstances. But you know, we try moaning and groaning, we try debating, we try handling the situation using our own strength. We're British. Stiff upper lip, show no emotion and accept no help. Is that true? Is that what we're like? Then maybe you hit rock bottom in life and you run out of options. There is no other option. There's nothing else you can do and then you realise there is something bigger than this situation. In fact, someone bigger than this. You realise that God is in control. And then you begin to realise that the way out begins with our attitude. Yeah? Our attitude. What does that have to do with it? What can that have to do with it? You begin to realise that, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, you begin to realise, come on a minute, maybe there's some truth in that verse, and you begin to mull it over. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Our attitude needs to be can do. You know, the first, I can do all those things. I've said it before, you know who's got the right attitude? Bob the Builder. Can we fix it? Ooh. It doesn't mention about, you know, we've got to do risk assessments, we've got to get permission off the council, can we do this, can we do that? No. We can do it. Yes, we can. Yeah, can do. Bob the Builder. A bit old to watch that, I know, but I still like it. <laughs> what happens then when we're exposed to negative attitudes? You know, I've worked, with, I've worked with a lot of people in my lifetime, but there was one person in particular, and I was put to work with him. I was on the other side of the planet working in New Zealand, in, in, this, in a city, and um, he was hard work, because everything you did, he, he would like want to do it a different way, or it would be so much better if we did it like this, or it would be so much better 
in Australia, or it was so, you know, why can't we do that? And it was just, you would be mentally and physically drained. And you know, two things would happen. The negative effects would have an effect on your life. Two, you would become mentally and spiritually and physically drained by this, all this negative stuff. And then other people would notice that you are becoming like that as well. You would kind of become infected with that negativity. So, you know, we've got to watch that. So does attitude matter? Well, from Paul and Silas' experiences that we've just read here, we can see that, yes, it, it matters a lot. Attitude matters a lot. Positive or negative attitude. Can do or can't be bothered. Attitude. Ask yourself a question. Now, this is a bit of a funny thing to ask, okay? But if you were a song, I think I've gone nuts. If you were a song, what would you be? All things are possible, or great is the darkness. <laughs> That's your choice. <laughs> you know, because sometimes it is that whole great is the darkness. It covers the land. Depression. You know, I won't even try and sing it. But anyway, what did Paul and Silas do when they found themselves in the midst of a mess? It couldn't really get any worse for them, could it? They were basically in a giant septic tank under the jail. It was horrible. It's where the rats were. It's where all the poop and everything else went. And they were there. It couldn't get any worse. No human rights. Nothing. They were there. Sore, beaten, bleeding, damp, smelly. So what was their response? They began. It says here that they began singing hymns and praising God out loud. In fact, so loud that the other prisoners could hear them. And they were listening in. Can you imagine it? I could sing of your love. Really? In this? You're singing that song now? They weren't singing and praising God for being in the mess and for being in that prison and for being in that, those stocks. They would be able to praise God in spite of that mess. Yeah? You wouldn't praise God. You wouldn't thank God. Oh, thank you, God, that I'm in prison. Thank you, God, that I've just been run over by a car. You don't thank God for things like that, but you're able to thank God in spite of things like that, yeah? That's the difference. God must have taken such pleasure in hearing that praise coming out of that place. And he must be thinking, yeah, those are my boys. I am their deliverer. Because as soon as they're singing and they're praying and they're, you know, that praise floated up to heaven, the foundations of the jail began to shake. His power literally shook the building. He left no doubt that he was the one and only true God. What an opportunity for God to work through his people. God was glorified in the midst of all this. And when God is glorified, people are drawn to him. Amen? Can you see the part that we played in this? They were set free. Everyone was set free because of the praise. Their praise gave God an avenue, a means of being able to work, a place, a, a street, a way to go. Yeah? Praising God opened up a way for God to do something and to deliver them in that situation. The word declares that God inhabits the praises of his people. That means that God lives in the praises of our people. You know, when we sing in those songs this morning about um, praising God and, and all those kind of things, you know, God's presence is magnified in here and it opens up a way for God to do a work in our lives. Yeah? It's fantastic, isn't it? The result of this praise was deliverance, signs, wonders, and salvation. Not only were they saved and delivered and set free by those around them, but in this case, the captors were also affected by the miracle. So the people, the jailer, he, he was on his knees, wasn't he? What must I do to be saved? He'd seen the, the, the salvation of God. He'd seen the mighty acts of God, what was happening there, and he knew he needed to do something about it. Satan tried to kill them, yet they turned the tables on him. And God blessed them. And the jailer and his whole household were saved. What a testament. Paul and Silas had a revelation. And because of it, they were praising God in spite of their circumstances. They had more confidence in God than their <coughs> outward circumstances. And that's the key, isn't it? If we've got more confidence in God than, the, than in man and in our circumstances and those things around us, that's a good start, isn't it? Many Christians would moan and complain and blame God for allowing them 
to get into this mess in the first place, wouldn't we? 1 Corinthians 10, 9-12 says this, Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, as were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Here we're encouraged to have a look at our complaining and our moaning. You know, we all like to do it, don't we? It's something slightly satisfying in having a moan and a complaint, isn't it? I was on the phone this morning to O2 because I had my bill, and uh, I was talking about this at the start of the service, and I got charged for being abroad, which is fine if you've been abroad. And I phoned him up about it. I said, well, you've been to Ireland. He said, no, I haven't. I've been to Holyhead Mountain. But that's in Ireland. No, it isn't. <laughs> we had a great conversation. It's, uh, I think we've sorted it out now. But it's, there's something slightly satisfying in having a moan, isn't there, sometimes? But anyway. But, um, we've got a choice, haven't we? When we're in a situation like that, when you're in the bottom of a pit, when there's nowhere else to go, the choice is to be destroyed or to be delivered. And you know we need to choose to be delivered, don't we? We don't give up. We don't dis get discouraged in the middle of life's trials. You know, we keep going. If we, if we give up, that opens the door to the destroyer. And it doesn't have to be that way, does it? We should praise God even louder during those times. If you know your God, you can stand up and begin to praise him and declare his goodness. And, you know, we can give God glory in the midst of praise, whatever Satan throws our way. You know, back when we were in Bible college, in our last year in Bible college, and, you know, we knew by then that we were going to emigrate. It's odd, isn't it? I'm talking about going to New Zealand, and God's brought people from New Zealand to come and, and pastor us here. But um, we were in the college, and it was the summer holidays, and we, we'd sent all our stuff that we could Pickford's, it was on its way there. Um, I was doing all the paperwork, I, I was getting all the visas and everything really like that, and it was taking a long time and it was taking longer than it should. And we were still in the college when the, the, year, the next year came and we should have left. Can you imagine that? And it was like, you know, what's that? Well, we've got nowhere to go really. We've sold everything and we've sent all that stuff. Um, can we stay here for a bit? Oh, okay then. And um, the one thing we didn't have was the residency permit, the paperwork. It was taking a long time. Doubts started creeping in. You know, patience was wearing thin. We needed results and we needed them fast. One morning, and this wasn't just any morning, it was the day we needed an answer. Deadlines had, been, had come and deadlines for a lot of things had arrived. And it was like time. I'd been to London the day before trying to sort things out to no avail. I came back empty-handed. I've had enough. This is it. And you know, my method, Jane and I both had diff different methods of, of dealing with this. My method was um, I shut myself in the bedroom and um, I had a go at God, you know, and I gave him some ultimatum. And um, that's never a good thing to do, really. I was going to jack everything in, cancel all my plans, go, this, I've had enough, I just can't keep going on like this. I've had enough. I'm at my end. This is it. And um, so I gave my ultimatums, I told God what I thought, I'd had enough, and um, I had a really good go. Janie had another idea, she put on a worship CD, she filled the flat that we were staying in with praise, she started singing along, you know, I'm like, don't you realise what's going on here, don't you realise the mess with how important today is, she just carried on, and it was, you couldn't help but sort of be lifted a bit by what was happening, and then about an hour later, the phone rang. And it was the it was New Zealand House, and the, the news was I could come and pick up my visas. So I don't know whether it was my frustration or my ultimatum, but I do know, or was it the praise and the worship of God in spite of those circumstances? Yeah. It was it was it was the heart of, of praise and worship to God opened up an avenue for what we needed to come, and it did. And I've noticed that the more you praise God the stronger your faith becomes. And you know what? We need strong faith in these days, in the times that we're living in. We need a strong faith. We don't need to be fence-sitters. We need to have a really strong, something in here so strong that will carry us through. Yeah? 
So the more we praise God, the stronger that faith becomes in us and the greater confidence we have in him. It's a decision that we all have to make. Paul and Silas showed what was really on the inside of them, didn't they? They showed what was inside. You know, the word says that as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Or if you're from Northern Ireland, so he is. Yeah? <laughs> said that before, sorry. <laughs> In the middle of everything that was going on, faith-filled praise rose out of their hearts and came out of their mouth. And we, the end result was God was glorified. And you know, and it's at times like this you find out what's on the inside of us. Yeah? There was something else to consider as well. People are watching. Whether we know it or not, people are watching us. Very often it's our reactions that get people's attention, not our actions. And you know, Paul and Silence had a Paul and silence. Silence. <laughs> there was certainly no silence. They had an audience. There was other prisoners. There was the jailers. They were there saying, hang on a minute. We've put these people, we've beaten them up. We've put them in the stocks. We've, we've made a right mess of them. And they're singing their praises to God. What's all that about? And then an earthquake came and opened all the doors and blew the stocks off and everything. And it's like, wow, this is just amazing. This is just too much. A manifestation of the presence of God. Now, if they'd been mumbling and complaining, their audience would have seen that as well. But they wouldn't have seen the awesome manifestation of the goodness of God either. And that door would have been closed. You know, in 1 Thessalonians 5, it tells us to, what? Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. But you know what? People often say, you know, I need to know the will of God. <laughs> there you go for a start. Rejoice ever more. Pray without ceasing and in everything. Give thanks. That's a great start, isn't it? You want to know God's will for your life. Those are three great things to start doing. Verse 18. In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Does this mean that we're supposed to give thanks for everything that comes our way? No, as I said, you wouldn't thank God for being run over by, by a bus, would you? But you can throw, you can praise him and thank him in spite of that. In spite of everything that happens to us, you know what God is saying yesterday, today, forever. Philippians 4.11 Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am, to be content. I know how to be abased, I know how to be abound, everywhere in all things. I've learned to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul certainly could say that, couldn't he? They proved God's word to be true in this difficult situation, and so can you. You know, we were saying earlier about the difficulties people are in. You know, we've all got things on our plate, don't we? And you know, we can overcome. If you're in Christ, and if you're a child of God, you know, you can overcome. Maybe you never thought about some of these things in this life before, but it's never too late to start, is it? So, we need to start rejoicing, we need to start developing the attitude of praise that Paul and Silas have. It's not just about singing songs to God. Praise is an attitude of our heart. Yeah? It's that positive, it's that, it's that can do, it's that, you know, God, you are great, you're looking up and not looking in. I'm not sure who put this together, but I quite liked it. Um, here's a quotation. It says, the wings of praise will open the door of blessings that will lift you higher than you could ever have got on your own. Soar with the thermals, praise will lift you higher than your own strength could take you. Praise lifts us above the storms of life instead of the storm destroying. It will lift us above the danger. The same force that would have destroyed us will be used as a catalyst through praise to put you above the very thing that was sent to destroy. Spread your wings of worship and soar with wings as eagles. So worship is faith in action, isn't it? It takes courage to stick out your wings in the middle of a storm and start soaring up, isn't it? Praising God silences the accuser. And we need to make that a habit, don't we? Psalm 34, verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. 
His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Your confidence will grow as you soar higher and higher. God will take something that Satan meant for your destruction and turn it around for our blessing. You know, and, and all through the Bible we see that. We see what happened to Joseph, didn't we? He was thrown again in a kind of, he was thrown in a pit. And that was meant for his destruction. But you know, God had other plans. And he was taken out of that pit. And, and you know, you, you know the story. But um, do you remember there was a campaign by a well-known atheist called Richard Dawkins. And he decided to put all over the London buses, you know, there's probably no God, so stop worrying and get on with your life and enjoy it, or something like that. And you know, that was, the idea of that was to like, oh, oh Christians would look at it, oh, there's probably no God. Oh, well, okay. And we just abandon our faith. You know, but it made people stronger. It made people start talking. It became like an evangelism tool almost. And you know, something that was intended to destroy actually was building up and encouraging and, and doing something. God got glorified, you know, and we walk in victory over our adversary. So we need to know this as well. God is seeking those to worship him in spirit and in truth. This is his desire for us. He's actively seeking worshippers. Will he find them in us? Will we be the ones? So we need to begin to meditate on the goodness of God until it becomes such a reality in our lives that the circumstances seem no more than a mild nuisance. Can you imagine how great that would be? That your circumstances are nothing more than a mild nuisance. You know, God's bigger than that. Yeah? It's about perspective, isn't it? I've said this before. That, you know, we see sometimes a mountain in front of us and we think, my goodness, that's such a difficulty. That's such a, uh, an obstacle to overcome. And you know what? And it talks in the Word about moving mountains. And it's, I've learned that it's not, you don't physically pick the mountain up and go like that, but you climb it and you get on the top of it and then it's moved. It's not in front of you anymore. It's under your feet. So you've got to start climbing it. You know, everywhere we look, we see misery and we see bad news. Yeah? We're told that every day we're in a mess. You know, we've had this Brexit now. It's going to ruin the com country. Other people say it's going to be great. Other people say, no, it's going to be awful. We're, we're, we're doomed. Yeah? And there's national debt and there's warmer globing and all that stuff. We're in a mess. We're, we're ruined. Not just as a country, but as a world. We've had it. There's plastic everywhere. There's all these things in the sea. The dolphins are dying. And you know, every time you turn the news on, there's something worse happening, isn't there? You know, a year ago, the most interesting thing in British politics was Ed Miliband eating a bacon sandwich in a funny way and making a face and everyone laughed at him, yeah? Now look at it. Look at, look at what's happened in 12 months. What a mess. You know, all the... All, all the political leaders are, are, you know, at each other's throats and terrorism and all this, this murder, and, murder and misery everywhere you look. And if you put the TV on to find something uplifting, you'll probably find a program about the national debt or about global warming or something, or that there's 10,000 jobs in jeopardy. You know, we should all move there. It sounds like a great place to work. All these jobs there. I don't know where it is. It's not in my atlas. But um, anyway, don't look to the TV for encouragement, it's the wrong place. Yes, we may be facing difficult times and uncertain times. People don't know how the future will look, what the EU exit will mean, change in government leaders, lots of changes, lots of uncertainty. But you know, as I said before, God's the same yesterday, today, forever. It doesn't matter who's in charge of the country, God is in charge. God is bigger, God is stronger, isn't he? What he's looking for is hearts that will lift up praise to him in spite of those difficulties around us. Let me finish with a few more verses from Philippians 4. Philippians 4, 8, very famous uh, words. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good before, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And then it says, those things which you both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace will be with you. So that's our challenge. You know, God is God. He's still God. Whatever the circumstances are, he doesn't change. We do. You know, it's cloudy outside, but the sun's still shining above the clouds. Yeah? And the same God is still God. 
in, in spite of the clouds, in spite of the circumstances and the difficulties that we face. So when we find ourselves in dire straits, praise God anyway. Yeah. Whatever happens to us in life shouldn't change how we think, how we feel, or how we act towards God, should it? It really shouldn't. It's powerful. It's victory. Satan will always seek to take our eyes off God, yeah, and in and down on ourselves and our circumstances. And that's a depressing place to look, isn't it? So we need to be looking out and looking up. When we look up and out instead of in and down, like Paul and Silas, we will open up an avenue for God to move. So we're in the, in the pit, whatever we're in, whatever circumstances we face, you know, God is good. Amen. God is great. And we should always praise him. Amen. I pray that's been an encouragement to you this morning.